Hey everyone, this is Emily with Snake Discovery. We all know that a normal type hognose snake looks like this, but what happens, genetically speaking, when you get an albino hognose snake? Today I'll be introducing you to the world of genetics when it comes to snakes. <music> Before we get started, let me just quick warn you that things might get a little confusing because in the world of genetics, things go pretty in-depth. So I'm going to be trying to explain it in an easy to understand way, and hopefully we'll all be on the same page at the end of this video. First, every genetic trait, whether it's the animal's color, its pattern, etc., is determined by a set of alleles on the chromosome. Alleles are usually represented as two strands connected in the middle, so I'm going to be using my index fingers, trying to connect them in the middle here, uh, to represent the alleles. When an animal reproduces, it will split off one of those alleles to its offspring, and the other parent will split off one of its alleles to its offspring, so the baby still has two alleles. When those alleles are both normal on the chromosome, that's when you get a normal wild-type colored animal. It has normal colors, it has a normal pattern, but when one of those alleles becomes mutated by a random happenstance, that's when you may or may not get a visual difference in the animal itself. Some of these mutations are recessive, which means that both of the alleles must be mutated in the same way in order to make a visual difference in the animal. And some of these mutations are dominant, which means they will take over the visual appearance, even if the other allele is still normal. This might sound a little confusing, so we're going to go through them one by one with hypothetical examples with images to help you out. Let's start with the recessive genes. Albinism is a very common recessive gene found in snakes. So let's hypothetically pair up a normal colored hognose snake with an albino snake. And basically when this pair reproduces, the normal hognose will split off one of its alleles to its offspring, and it could pair off either one of these, but since both of them are normal, it doesn't matter. Whichever one it splits off, the normal or a normal allele will get passed to the young. On the other hand, this parent will split off a mutated albino allele to its young. And again, it could split off this one or this one, but either way, they're both mutated, so it doesn't really matter. It's going to split off an albino mutated allele to the offspring. That leaves us with an offspring that has one normal allele from this parent and one mutated albino allele from this parent. That makes this baby het or heterozygous for albinism. Since the albino gene is recessive, it still looks normal. An albino snake must have both mutated albino alleles in order to be albino itself, but it still carries the albino gene. So let's pair this baby, we're going to hypothetically raise it up and we are going to pair it with another albino hognose snake. This parent will split off, just like before, an albino allele, doesn't matter which one, they're both mutated for al albinism, and our heterozygous albino snake here, which looks normal but carries the albino gene, will either split off the normal allele, creating a het for albino baby, just like the parent over here is, since it got the mutated albino allele from this parent and normal from the het parent over here, or this parent might split off its albino allele, which would then pair up with the albino allele it received from that parent, and the baby would therefore be homozygous for albinism. And since the albino gene needs to have both alleles mutated in order to show it, this baby would, in that case, be an albino. So if you think about it, with this pair of animals, we have a 50-50 chance of creating albino babies, all based on which allele is split from this parent. So about half of their babies will be albino, half will be normal, and this occurs in the same clutch. You might have six eggs with three albinos, three normals, all dependent on what that parent does. Now let's move on to how a dominant gene works. For this example, we'll be using the pastel gene in hognose snakes, and the pastel gene adds a little bit more yellow into their scales. This is also a trait that's commonly found in ball pythons, but in ball pythons, it works a little bit differently. I'll explain a little bit more later. With a dominant trait, it only takes one mutated allele in order to show that trait in the snake. So for hognose snakes, whether the snake has one or both of its alleles mutated for that pastel gene, it'll just show up as a normal pastel hognose snake. For this example, we're going to again pair up a normal hognose snake to, let's do uh, a hognose snake that has both of its alleles that are mutated for the pastel gene. This parent will split off a pastel allele, this parent will split off a normal allele, 
and its babies will all have one normal allele and one pastel mutated allele, and they will all just look like normal pastel hognose snakes. Now let's pair one of those babies to another completely mutated hognose snake for the pastel gene. They both look the same because it doesn't matter whether one or both of the alleles are mutated. This parent will split off one of its pastel alleles, and this baby will split off either a normal allele, creating a het for pastel, so to speak, that will just look like a pastel hognose snake, since this is a dominant trait, or that adult will split off its pastel allele, so the baby will be homozygous for pastel, but it'll look the same. There is no super form or super pastel for the hognose snakes. However, there are super forms for co-dominant traits like seen in ball pythons. So we're going to move on to those traits next. If you ever hear the term super pastel or super something, they're referring to what's called a co-dominant morph. For this example, we'll be using the anaconda phase or the anaconda morph, which is a co-dominant trait. The anaconda gene or anaconda mutation reduces the amount of pattern on the hognose snake. So if you have a snake with both normal alleles, of course it will look like a normal hognose snake. If you have a snake with one mutated allele for the anaconda gene, then the snake will be what's called a condomorph, like the one I had out earlier. And finally, if you have a snake with both of those alleles that are both mutated for the condomorph, that's when you get what's called a superconda. Both of these alleles remove pattern, and if they're both mutated, all of the pattern is removed altogether. So let's see how this works in a breeding experiment. We're going to pair up one conda hognose snake with another conda hognose snake. Both parents might split off their normal alleles to the offspring, which creates a normal baby. This parent could split off its normal allele, and this parent could split off its mutated allele, creating a het for conda hognose, which would be just another conda hognose snake. Or the final outcome would be is if one parent split off its conda allele, and if this parent also split off its conda allele, creating a baby that has two conda alleles, this is what creates a super conda hognose snake. Basically, both of those alleles are scripted to reduce pattern, and together they reduce all of the pattern. If just one of the alleles is conda and the other one is normal, then it reduces just some of the pattern. So hopefully this video wasn't too confusing for you. I made it so that everyone can be prepared for when the babies look different from their most recent clutch. I'm expecting about 25% normals, 50% condos like their parents, and 25% to be super condos since this is a co-dominant trait. This pair had eight eggs and they are due to hatch in about two more weeks. And when the first one starts hatching, then I will do an egg cutting live on YouTube. If you want to be a part of it and watch it with me, then you can just follow me on my Instagram account or my Facebook account as I'll be updating both of those to tell everyone when the big day is and the night that I will be cutting them open just to peek inside and see what we get. So anyway, hopefully this video helped you understand the three most commonly seen traits in snakes, recessive, dominant, and co-dominant, and how they work. And if you want a part two where I could talk about sex-linked traits and line-bred traits, let me know. Maybe I could put something together for you. But anyway, we'll see you next week.